On behalf of all of my colleagues, welcome to another McGuffin Mornings. My name is Chris Scullis. I am President and Chief Creative Officer at the McGuffin Creative Group, and we are glad that you're here. Uh, it's a great turnout today. Um, I see a lot of returning people. So glad that you made it. Um, at McGuffin? What? Oh, good. <laughs> Uh, at McGuffin, we are always looking for new innovations, new ways of thinking, uh, different perspectives, and ways to push ourselves. We put this series together to share our ideas and our findings with our friends, our colleagues, and clients. So thank you for coming. Uh, let's see. And it is my pleasure to introduce Jennifer Wright Fonderbay. Close. Well done. It's just like it's it's spelled out. Um, over Jennifer's 25 year career, she's been both on agency and client side, which I really respect. Here we go. It's long. It's really you can cool. just fly through. Really <laughs> going fast. It's a short path. Account director at Bookbone and Belding, partner management director at J. Walter Thompson, vice president and account director at Noble. She's vice president, BB corporate. Marketing at Navitech. Global head of integrated marketing at Nokia. My favorite phone was Nokia. It was like this big. It was awesome. Uh, Vice President of Retail Marketing and Communications at Assuron and VP Marketing Communications at Apollo Education Group. You did it. Uh, Jennifer now addresses companies, advises companies, ensuring that during times of change, the human component of a company's plan remains the cornerstone of success. She's just finishing her first book called Now What? And today she's going to talk with us about the power of gut instinct in decision making and how intuition should never be underestimated, especially in business. Um, it's a little bit controversial and we love it, so please give a warm McGuffin Mornings welcome to Jennifer Bondi. Do, uh, if anyone wants to still come up front, please please feel free to do so. So very excited to be here, I have to say. Um, it is always kind of fun when you hear your introduction to hear all the things that you've done. And I, it's taken me back to my ad agency days, which were wonderful days. I can feel the creativity and the ideas just happening in this room. It's oozing out of everyone's pores. So. That's a good thing, uh, and it is a, a relevant piece of what I'm gonna talk about. Uh, because as, as Chris said, it is a little bit of a controversial topic, and I had an epiphany last summer that led me to make this presentation. But at the root of it, it's funny, because while I was going through this odyssey, I was reminded of the days that I was in ad advertising, and I used to work with copywriters and account directors and art directors, and they'd always say to me, and even after all the research and all the data that we've looked at, what does your gut tell you? How does this, how does this campaign make you feel? Uh, and I, I'd have to confess, I've kind of lost sight of that. Um, it's a long list of different marketing jobs that I've had, and it was during the course of that that I started to feel that I was getting too far to one side on data. Uh, and I suspect I'm not alone in that odyssey. And I'm thankful for this little epiphany moment that I had last summer. Uh, I will share that with you in a minute. But one of the things that I want to make sure that, that you take away from this discussion, because it is controversial, um, and I'm going to highlight the, all the things I've learned about it. Um, but at the end, I do want to share with you some of what I learned in terms of how to help cultivate a gut instinct, not just for ourselves, but for our teams because one of the big things that I felt was happening is not only was I not trusting my gut enough, I wasn't role modeling the behavior that I, that I thought was important and that I realized with all of the obsession about data, it wasn't helping my teams enough to better understand how to cultivate their own gut instinct. So that's a big part of what I wanna make sure you, you take away um, at the end of our session. And it's interesting because when I had this epiphany last summer, then I pulled a number of my marketing colleagues, my advertising colleagues, to see was I the only one that was having this issue? Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't just me. Uh, a number of, of people who I respected equally 
felt that they weren't trusting their gut enough. So that's why I started to do a little digging. And what's interesting is, this actually, you'd think it's all now, right? That this obsession with data, but even Einstein, I think he's a pretty smart guy, at least that's, that's what I've read. Even Einstein said, the intuitive mind is a sacred gift, and the rational mind is a faithful servant. We have created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. And I really, I thought, oh my, man, he's captured it. That's, that's how I felt that we were becoming, not just me, again, a full of colleagues, but we were so fixated on the quantitative part of things that we weren't thinking about what the emotional side uh, meant and, and how that could influence our decision making. And so let me tell you a little bit about the epiphany. And again, I'm not gonna bore you with family photos. Um, this is the only one, I swear. Um, the, the one highlight that I will make about it, so this happened on vacation. We, uh, we drove to South Dakota, drove through the Badlands. We're that kind of family, we do road trips. And we went, while we were in South Dakota, we went to visit the Minuteman missile silos. I had no idea how many Minuteman missile silos had been buried, not only in South Dakota, but in the heartland. And so while we were there, we visited museums, and we visited the Minuteman uh, Missile Silo Museum. Yes, again, we're that kind of family. And while I was on that um, trip through the museum, I learned about the number of times we had actually come, had come this close to all out nuclear war. I had no idea. Not only did I have no idea how many silos were buried, but I had no idea that there actually had been a number of times um, that we had almost gone to war with Russia. And what was fascinating to me, there was one story in particular where I literally, I, I just, that was my epiphany moment. And in this uh, story, I learned about Stanislav Petrov. Has anyone here ever heard of him? Okay, all right, there's a, a, a few souls who have. So Stanislav Petrov was the Soviet officer on duty in September of 1983. <laughs> now remember, we're right in the middle of the Cold War at this point. Um, Russia had actually shot down a South Korean airline, 007, um, three weeks prior to this and had killed everyone on board. They thought the airline uh, was spying and was a spy plane. And so the reality is I can't emphasize enough how at the brink of war we were, when Stanislav Petrov is on duty and sees uh, on his early warning system that five intercontinental ballistic missiles are on their way to Russia. Now, his protocol was to immediately alert supervisors that these missiles were on their way. And then the next thing was to launch a counterattack. But he didn't do that. And for 15 minutes, because that's the period of time that he's supposed to, to be planning and sending a counterattack, for 15 minutes he had no idea if he had made the right call or not. Now, fortunately, I'm standing here and able to talk to you about it, so clearly he made the right call. But what was interesting and fascinating to me, and this is where I had my epiphany moment, was he was asked, why didn't you launch a counterattack? That's what your protocol said. And he said, because it, he didn't feel right, he trusted his gut. What he believed was that if the US were gonna launch an attack on Russia, there was no way they would only send five missiles. They would have sent an all out launch. So he had just this feeling that it was a false alarm and it turned out to be exactly that. But the reality was, and, and that was what I thought to myself, holy cow, this man made a life or death decision based on his gut. And in the past, I think, and, and perhaps maybe you've had the same impression, right? We think gut instinct, intuition, inner wisdom, it sounds kind of flighty and new agey. Um, and I would have to confess, I kind of felt the same way. Ah, you know, it's your gut instinct, it just doesn't feel right. But what he did in this moment that helped me understand was his gut was based on all of his military training, all of his experiences, all the research that he had done on the United States. So it was a collection of all of that information that helped him to make that decision. And so for me, that was a really powerful moment to really 
better understand and appreciate what it means to trust your gut. And it was at that point that I thought, if he can do this, why am I not doing it more? So before I go on too far, I do think it's important to just pause a second because I've kind of thrown a variety of words around, right? So how do we define intuition, instinct, gut instinct, inner wisdom? So there's two aspects to it. First is instinct, right? The body's biological tendency to make one choice over another, otherwise known as fight or flight. And literally, your body just reacts. It's, it's if you do it without thinking. The other aspect is intuition. That's the subconscious integration of all the experiences, conditioning, and knowledge of a lifetime, including the cultural and emotional biases of that lifetime. So again, I think that's, it's important to really understand because I think we throw gut instinct around and it's just, it's just a feeling, right? And I know, <laughs> I'm confident most everyone in here would really have a hard time walking into their boss and just saying, you know, just like, it feels to me like we've got to do this. There's no way you would do that, right? No way. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how to, how to overcome that. But I think it's important to really understand your, your gut instinct is probably the biggest data processor you have access to because it's been collecting information over your entire lifetime. And that is what I hadn't appreciated before. But now you can see I'm a little bit on a, on a mission, so. Now you would think the process of making a decision is simple, right? There's really, there's only four steps if you think about it. First, framing the problem. Next, we get to searching for possible solutions. Third part, evaluating those solutions, and then lastly, making the decision. It's kind of like when you're in math class, it always looks so simple when the teacher puts it up there, right? Gosh, how, how hard is it to make a decision? Yet I know, I've, I've been in the marketing advertising world, right, to get from a creative brief through the strategy, through the creative development to production, that is so not the easy path. There are so many variables and variations that can happen along the way. How, how many times have you been trapped? Months just trying to make sure you're framing the right problem. It takes time and it takes a lot of patience and understanding. And then on top of that, so not only is it tough to make a decision, but now we've got an abundance of choices. I don't know if you can see, this is just shampoo. Right? I mean, shampoo is important to me. I, I, how do you make a choice on even what shampoo to buy? And research has actually shown the more comprehensive and complex the possibility of choices, the more difficult the decision is to make. Because literally the computing power required for your brain, it outstrips your brain's computing power. There's just too many choices. Frankly, that's why uh, in many categories, the, the, the companies buy for that middle part of the shelf, because that's the, more, the most likely place for you to look. So the reality is, and thanks to efficiencies and productivity and operations, now we've got more choices. So you've got more choices, more data, and less time. Now the one, the one thing I do wanna highlight, because I think oftentimes, um, they're, they're, and even you could have had this interpretation of my presentation, right? That I'm not all behind data or even big data. I actually, I'm in, involved with big data in a way that I never expected to be. And I appreciate the value of big data. It's made us exponentially smarter. The issue that I have is the expectation that comes with big data. And that expectation is that every decision and recommendation that we make is somehow based on every possible scenario, every possible piece of data that we could get our hands on. And it's that expectation, it's the seduction of data and the expectation that comes with it that I find difficult and, and, and that I struggle with. Who, who here hasn't been in a presentation where you're about to make a recommendation and you think that you have literally considered every possible variable and scenario. And you present it, you're really excited about the recommendation, you think it's gonna be great. And someone at the end of the table says, that's a really great analysis. But did you consider X? And you, you just wanna kick that person off the table, right? Laser beams are coming out of your eyes. 
Because the reality is, well, I considered A, B, C, and D. And I could have considered X, Y, and Z. But at some point, you've got to make a decision. There's always going to be other variables to, to consider. And the reality is, with data, we've just gotten a much more complex decision-making tree. There's just so many paths that you can take, right? But again, I don't want this to come across as I'm not a believer in big data. It has made us smarter. What I worry about is it's taken us away from the power of gut instinct. Okay, so we're going to do a little exercise. For those of you on Facebook Live, um, you can write on a piece of paper as well. So on your um, desk table, there should be a sheet. There's one with the caricature. Well, there's two with the caricature, but it's the one that says cultivating the human point of view and an era of data-driven decision-making. So you'll see the first question. Now, the first question I'd like you to fill out is detail a decision you have been meaning to make. Perhaps it's been a few days or even a few weeks, but you haven't made it yet. So I'm not asking you to make the decision. I'm asking you to write down what's a decision that's pending, something that you've been thinking about. Now, don't worry. I'm not going to make you. I can see some people like, oh, if my boss is here, he's going to think I already made the decision. So no, OK? Um, you're not going to have to share this with anyone. We're just going to do an exercise. So you get to keep this to yourself. But just write down what's a decision that's pending. <laughs> Some of you, it's probably hard to choose, right? So many decisions that you've still got to be making. And you're even allowed to put down a decision that's been sitting there for months. Okay, now the next part of the exercise, and see question two. It says, list why you have not made that decision. Be honest with yourself. Again, I'm not going to make you share it, so write down a decision that's been pending, and then a couple of reasons why you think you haven't made it yet. Okay, and that's okay. I'll, you can still keep writing if you haven't finished. But I want to keep this moving. So I've talked a lot about big data, the, the issues with decision making, the fact that you've got more choices, <coughs> more uh, information to analyze, and then I've talked about the fact that, and there's more distractions. I, I'm pretty confident I'm not alone. Right? I want to just talk a little bit about what's an average marketing or ad executive's day. What's it look like? So if any of you are like me, um, and I'm going to assume there's probably a, a few of you out there, Sunday night, right? you're envisioning what your Monday's going to be. Because we've all learned the power of manifesting and envisioning. right? So I'm gonna, my Monday's going to be super efficient. So Sunday night, I'm thinking about, here's all the things i got to take care of. And it's, it feels like this on Sunday night. So I, I'm going to get in, I'm going to check my emails, make sure I'm smart, I've got the team meeting, we're talking about the digital campaign, our trade show, new webinar we've got coming up. Uh, I also go to a uh, leadership meeting, have some numbers to uh, present and discuss with the leadership, but everything's on track, right? This, on Sunday night, is what my Monday is going to look like. Now, anybody else have that, have that kind of hope and aspiration? Okay, I'm probably also not alone though, because here's what it feels like on Monday night, right? You had a speech that you'd worked on, the CEO calls and says, I don't really like the speech, I don't like the direction it's going in, we've got to start all over. Someone quits, so now that white paper that you had in motion, now you've got to assign to somebody else, but it's due out the door by the next week. 
uh, you attend the senior leadership meeting. Here what I envisioned was that it was a magnificent senior leadership meeting, but the actual meeting goes off on a tangent. Somebody questions the webinar registration that now you've got to defend. Here's the reality. You, you, you have so many distractions, so as much as you can control, you try. But the reality is there's so much that you just can't control, despite all your envisioned powers. And that's not to say that that's bad, it's just our reality. Uh, when I was actually thinking about what a day looks like, I haven't even factored in here the number of emails you get and send. I actually looked it up. Um, the Radic Hottie Group, which does research on this, said in 2016, 205 billion emails were sent and received daily. There's so seven and a half billion people on the planet. Not everyone has internet access, so there are a lot of people sending uh, a lot of emails, and they actually project that to go to 250 billion by 2019. So you've got more data uh, to analyze, more choices, and less time. And I think to myself, so why don't we trust our gut more? Why don't we? Well, it's because, as Einstein said earlier, we thrive in a culture that believes rationality and prevailing scientifically proven logic rules over intuition and instinct. It's just, again, I made the joke before, but I'll, I'll everybody nodded their head. You're not really gonna feel too comfortable walking in and saying, you know, I just have a feeling we really need to go this way. It's just, it's, it, this is just not how we've been trained. It's not how we've operated. And frankly, that's why I felt compelled to do a little research, to test some of this hypothesis, right? I've talked to you about, I think we're not trusting our gut enough, but I wanted to make sure beyond the people I had just kind of casually talked to, I wanted to find out, is this really the reality? And so I did. I spent a lot of time testing my hypothesis. The first thing I did was I read a lot of research. Number of periodicals. There's a ton of research out there if you just take a little bit of time, right? So everything from Wired Psychology Today. I did read Playboy. As my dad used to say, there were some very good articles in there. Okay. And actually, it was, a, a, it, it was. It was about trusting your gut. And I also read Cosmopolitan. Although that um, article on trusting your gut was not about work decisions. But it was still a very fascinating article. Um, but the reality is, the fascinating part for me was during this entire research, the conclusion was everybody agrees to disagree. Because for every article, that said, trust your gut, five instincts you shouldn't ignore. Trust it, trust it, here's what to do, here's how to use it, this is the way to benefit from it. For as many articles as I read that said, trust your gut, there were equally articles that said when to listen to your gut and when not to. Not so fast, don't listen to it. Even, even when I've talked about this throughout, people, will be, people I'll have 50% who say, I, I think you're onto something, Jennifer, I really think that's important. 50% will say, absolutely not. Don't go that way. And then for me, the defining moment was, even in the Harvard Business Review, there were two articles, when to trust your gut, and then don't trust your gut. <laughs> right? So I'm thinking, okay, well, the, the reality is, we're not in agreement. It truly is divided. Then I thought, okay, well, I'm gonna actually do a survey. So I, I did a survey monkey. I get a little obsessive when I have a, when I have a question I want solved. So in the survey, even, I looked at and asked, a number of colleagues, and I got probably about 500. Maybe it's because I'm too close to the microphone. And even in this survey, I was 50% right. The reality was, right? I asked, okay, my questions were, do you, do you defer, defer decisions if you feel you've got not enough data or too much data, and how are you helping cultivate uh, a gut instinct with your teams? And the reality was, 50% claim they don't have enough data, 45% felt that they had too much data. Oh, here are uh, some of the verbatims, right, which I thought were hysterical, and I won't bore you with all of it, because again, I had 500 people, but there's never enough data to completely avoid an element of gut, and data's never perfect. Sometimes there's too much, sometimes there's too little. So the reality was, even in the survey that I did, it was split, and what was interesting to me was that the senior marketers said, even when I use my gut, it's like 99% nine, nine, nine of the time I'll, I'll use it, but it's for very small decisions. I wouldn't trust it for big decisions. And they equally said, 
And I, and I know I'm not role modeling for my team the importance of trusting your gut and, and tapping into that more. So I thought, here's the reality. We're, we're split. There will be as many people, probably here, if I'll, I'll use this room, right? 50% of you are probably saying, yes, this makes sense. I think she's on to something. 50% are saying, wow, I'm glad there was a really good breakfast here because I just don't think I need this. So if, if I can at least reach out to the 50% who think, yeah, you know, this is, this is something that's valuable, I may be able to convert some non-believers. So let me talk about some of the things that I've learned that help me in terms of cultivating a gut instinct and how to tap it more. So the first is make mental space. That is now more important than ever. And, and you've heard it before, people say they get some of their best ideas when they're in the shower, they go on long walks. It's because you're getting away from distraction. When your brain is consumed with distraction and information, you're in meetings, you've got people coming in and out of your office, you don't have the mental space to think clearly all the time. So that's not to say that you're not making good decisions in your office. It simply means that if you really want some clarity, you've got to make mental space. And whether that's shutting your door, whether that's going outside, whether that's taking showers all day long, but you've got to make it because no one's going to make it for you. It's interesting, I, uh, I presented this a number of times and typically I say at the beginning of my presentation, Please close your laptops, don't use your devices. Uh, we'd love to just take this you know, 15, 30 minutes with you and, and share a couple things with you. And a woman at the end of it said to me, well, you're, you're hurting yourself. People can't tweet about you and people can't write things about you. And I said, I'm willing to sacrifice that for me just to give you that mental space in order to think and listen and hear what I have to say. But not, that's not gonna happen frequently. More people are gonna take your time than not, so you've gotta make that mental space to give yourself the clarity of mind. Listen to the first answer. So when you were little, typically your teacher, if you said, you know, on the standardized tests, the teacher would say, go with your first answer. Now, I'm not saying go with your first answer, because sometimes there's a lot of things you still need to formulate and think about, but listen to that first answer because that first answer traditionally is coming from your gut. It's coming from your mind's assessment of what the decision should be. So jot it down, write it down. What was the first answer that came into your head when you were asked? Next, drop out of your head. This one's hard. Um, it kind of moves along the lines of making mental space, but drop out of your head to listen to your gut. Your brain's really powerful and it's got a lot going on but sometimes it's gonna only push for the rational. And you need to be able to think, okay, but what, what does my gut tell me? How do I feel about this? I go back to the art directors in particular and I always say, how does this make you feel? Think about that and give yourself the opportunity to, to drop out of your head. This one is really important and I say this because one of the things I find that I hear repeatedly and get challenged on is yes, but gut instinct, we're gonna be biased. All that information we've collected, we have a natural inherent bias, and I absolutely agree, and I think that is true. You're, you're gonna lean one way or the other. Um, I think we try and be objective, but sometimes we, we just can't be. Having a panel of trusted advisors, so people around you who will force you to look at it from multiple perspectives. So make sure you, you have people on that trusted advisor panel who play devil's advocate who don't allow you to, to just go the way you think you should go. But then, when they give you their input, combine it with your gut instinct. I think it's really important, again, to overcome what is potentially inherent bias. The reality is data also can add bias, right? We can only look at the data that supports it. Data may be, even the way we craft the data can have bias. So again, there's always a flip side to it. But for me, having a panel of trusted advisors who help you think about all aspects will only make you better. And then lastly, chronicle decisions when gut factored in. Now I know this is hard because of the reality of the time, we barely have time to write anything down, much less a decision. Uh, and the, the key to this, and I'll explain why in a minute, but write it longhand. Don't just type it into your computer, but write it down. If you can, even go so far as to have a journal of time 
times that you made a decision based on gut. What this does is it starts to actually train your brain to accept that, oh, this, is, this actually works. This, this can be a positive way to make a decision. If you actually write down times where you trusted your gut and the decision was the right one and it went well, it rewards your brain for, for following through on that and making sure that, hey, I can do this again and this could work. Now, the reason why I say write it longhand is research has also shown that the more you write things down, the more you retain it. Less so on the computer. I can't explain the, the neuroscience of it, but I found that that's fascinating. The more you write it longhand, the more likely it is that you will continue to do it and do it again and then you will retain it. So I wanted to take a, a little bit of time to talk about here's how to help ourselves. The reality is I feel like the, the decision-making process is getting away from us, right? And why am I so obsessed about cultivating a gut instinct? Well, there's two reasons. One, leadership development. I said I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about not just how we do it for ourselves, but how do we cultivate gut instinct for our teams. The second reason why I think it's important to cultivate the gut instinct is the impending zombie apocalypse. Now you laugh, right? There's God knows how many shows about zombies out there. The reality is this is not the scenario that I'm most worried about when we talk about the zombie apocalypse, right? What I am most worried about is the apocalypse that was presented in Wally. Who here saw the movie Wally? Good, okay. I a couple of people on Facebook Live, I think I saw raise their hands. So here's We're just floating around in our happy utopian world. And I that freaked me out. Because we'd given up the power of decision making. We actually were just happy floating around. And I thought, holy Moses, we're headed down that path. So I'm not the, the other zombie scenario doesn't worry me. This one does, because I can see it happening. It's already started. Right? You, you think Wally's far off? Here's the reality. Oh, I just had to, I forgot, I put the, I just love that picture. That's us floating around in the future, just watching a lot of TV. So here's the reality. It's already happened. So even before this, right? Computers, now, I've got to prove that I'm a human. Before I can actually even input in, uh, more data or information, I've got to prove that I'm a human to software, an algorithm, a computer. It's already started. I, I joked with my dad, because I talked about this with him for a, uh, for a while. I said, this happened, this has already started 20 years ago. Paper towel dispensers. We no longer get to decide how we dry our hands in the bathroom, right? You either, if you gotta wave, or, or you gotta put it in a, I, I, I can't even decide how much paper I get, or sometimes I can't have paper and the wave, right? So they have both, but I find it hysterical. Uh, decision making is already starting to leave us. Okay, you laugh about the bathroom, but I'm just saying that's one small example, and then think about this one. So it's, we laugh, we're all focused on AI, artificial intelligence, and I always keep saying, wow, if we spent as much time making other human beings as smart as we're trying to make these computers, how better off we would be. How important is that? How critical is that? And, and again, I'm, I'm not against AI, I think there's some great things happening. But I, my, my mission, my fixation now is how do I help make people smarter? How do I help us tap into the power that we already have and that we may not be tapping into? So that's why, for me, the, the next piece of this is really important. Uh, I gave you some tips on how do you help cultivate a gut instinct for yourself. Uh, and those were actually a combination of things I started to do, people giving me input, and ways to really have, help you tap your own gut instinct. Now I want to spend a little bit of time though as leaders, and all of us are leaders. You don't have to have someone reporting to you to be a leader. We all have an opportunity to model the behavior that we want to see. And so for me, these five steps I think are really important. So first is accept failure truly. And I put the truly on there for a reason. 
I always love, you read all these articles about entrepreneurs who say they learn from their failures and that's when they went off to make a gazillion dollars. I, I don't know about you, but in my corporate jobs, when somebody makes a mistake, everyone's looking for who to blame, mm -hmm. right? So we can talk about accepting failure, but the reality is it's not always acceptable. But to truly start to value your gut, accept failure truly, and listen to what was the failure and why did it happen, and think about that, evaluate it. Did the failure occur because the data that you got was the wrong data, or it gave you perhaps one scenario that really wasn't true? If you think about, rather than wasting time trying to figure out, well, who do I blame, spend some time thinking about the failure and what caused it. And, and learn from that, learn from the failure. Second, conduct a pre-mortem. So I love this idea. Uh, I think post-mortems typically are a part of all of our processes. Why? We look at an event, we think about how successful it was or was not, and think about uh, how to make it even better the next time. A pre-mortem, and actually this is, comes from a senior scientist, his name is Gary Klein. I think he actually won a Nobel Prize. But in a uh, pre-mortem, so you, you've made the decision, but then you take out, and you're just gonna now start to do this. You take out, before you even go to execution on the decision, you take out a crystal ball. And you look ahead and you say, uh-oh, it failed. It didn't go right. What are all the reasons it could fail? And you do this collectively as a team. So even before you've gone to execution, you allow the team to come together and think about all the ways that this might not work. And again, that, that collective discussion and experience helps your brain to think about, and it helps your team come up with, okay, well, what are the solutions? If it does fail, how are we gonna make sure that that doesn't happen? But it allows you, in that moment, to not have bias, to not have the finger pointing. It's a pre-mortem where it allows people to be a devil's advocate because you're asking for that input. You're asking for that challenge. And in that scenario, it helps your brain again think about, okay, well, if that experience happens, it starts to train your brain to think about scenarios and all of the ways that you could do something. And I just think it's a, I, having done this a, a couple of times with my teams, it's a great scenario uh, and a way for people to feel as though they're contributing to the solution. Third, be a role model. So as a, as a leader, as a teammate, uh, you have an opportunity to role model the behavior that you wanna see. Demonstrate to your team when you've made a decision based on gut instinct and how you got to that decision and why. The more you share how you came to a decision, why you came to it that way, the more you give an opportunity to take that risk. Because it is. It's risk taking. But it allows your teams to see, okay, this decision was based on gut and it went well. There was a lot that went into that decision. It doesn't minimize the gut, it actually highlights the importance and value uh, of your gut instinct. Show your work. So it goes along with being a role model. I think oftentimes we're so busy and we're going so fast that we don't step away and talk through, okay, what happened? How did we make this decision? Again, a lot of this you'll, you'll see <coughs> the pre-mortem to being a role model to showing your work. I know it's hard. I showed you that slide earlier. I know what our days look like. But you've got to make that time. You have to take that pause and, and demonstrate the steps you took logically, how you looked at the data, how you listened to your gut, and how you combined the two. Because really, at the end of the day, that's what it's about. I'm not preaching, hey, now make every decision based on gut. I'm just simply saying the emphasis on taking all, getting all of the data, analyzing the information, crunching the numbers, and coming up with purely data-driven solutions is undermining our ability to really think about what does our gut instinct tell us and how do we tap that more. So show your work. It shows that there is power and opportunity with a gut instinct. And lastly, encourage looking at work. So sessions like this are fabulous, really important to do and it is so hard. I know every time you come to one of these, you're thinking, ooh, but I'm giving up time at the office. I've got a deliverable. I've got a due date. Should I really go to that thing? I don't know. 
you have to. You've got to make times for that because what happens? And it's just the natural nature of work. You're at work, you're getting things done. You are tunnel vision trying to get everything done that's on your plate. So it goes back to the making mental space. If you don't make mental space, and if you don't get outside of your, of your work environment, your learning won't grow as quickly as it can. And the reality is, I, as I walked around and talked to people here, I'm hoping to keep the street going, but so many people said, I love the dust <coughs> mornings. I learn so much. It gets me out of my head. It takes me to uh, a different place and allows me to even think differently when I go back into my office about something. That's what learning outside of your office is all about. So I really encourage that. And I know I, I put my hand up. I have those many moments where I'm like, I really I can't get out of the office today. Try, because it will make such a big difference in your ability to evaluate not only the work that you're doing, but how you think about things. Because you're getting new input, and new data, and new information. So I would like to start with Einstein, and end with Freud. Uh, they're both very serious looking guys. I, I know women said uh, important things about this too, but I just love these pictures. So when making a decision of minor importance, I have always found it advantageous to consider all the pros and cons. <coughs> that said, in final matters, however, the decision should come from the unconscious, from somewhere within ourselves. And I thought this was just brilliant because it, it captures what I've been talking about for the last 40 minutes. And it's an opportunity just to pause and think, okay, there's something, there's something here. Again, I'm not expecting you all to run out and now start walking into your boss's office and say, ah, you know, I got a feeling. We're gonna do this. But don't dismiss it. I've given you tips not only for yourself, but to help your teams better develop their inner wisdom and to think about how to tap that more. As I said, your mind is the most powerful data processor that you have. It's been collecting information all of your life. So with that, I'm going to have you take out that piece of paper again. Same for you folks on Facebook Live. And we're going to do uh, a final exercise. But before we do that final exercise, everyone have a piece of paper out? Okay. And I'm not going to steal from you, but I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. I'm going to try and help you make some mental space. Okay. Everyone's got their eyes closed. So you're making mental space. Forget about everything you just heard other than some of the tips that I gave you. As you're making that mental space, I want you to think about the decision that's been pending. I want to ask you to write down at the beginning of this exercise. And I want you right now, first answer that pops into your head for that decision. Think about what the question is and how you should answer it. And I now want you to write that down. And I'm going to guess based on the statistics of the number of people who've come up to me after my presentation, that a lot of you actually did write down an answer. And what's funny to me is how many people come up to me afterwards and say, I knew this was the right answer, I just hadn't been doing it. And thank you for that exercise, because by writing it down, I mentally committed to just do it. And sometimes, listen, I, there's no shame I, I have so many decisions pending. But if you don't make the mental space and you don't give yourself the opportunity to just pause and think about, what should I really do with this? What happens is that decision just sticks in your head and it sits there and it sits there and it takes up really important mental energy that you could be contributing and devoting to something else. So not only is this important just for the thought of using your gut instinct more for bigger decisions and the risks that you can take. But it's equally important for you as a person to give yourself some space 
in your brain to really make the, the decisions that you need to. And it's funny because I've also had people come up and say, I just had so many decisions, I didn't even know which one to pick, right? But, and I get that. But think about how many times if you just thought about the first answer that came to your head and executed on it, how much you could get those things just out of your way. So that's, that's really what I wanna make sure that is your takeaway today. I'm not trying to convert, there are gonna be certainly many people who still think, ah, yeah, but I think that's just all kind of fluff. Um, and there is, there is an aspect to it, right? It's, it's your gut that I'm, I'm telling you to tap. And, and data, it's gonna just, it's will clearly be a critical piece of how we make decisions. And I'm, I'm thankful for that, because it, again, I said it's made us exponentially smarter. I think there's an opportunity, though, for us to, to combine it. And um, as I end, here's what I will tell you. I am actually so fixated on the power of gut instinct. Um, I actually, uh, decided to start my own company. Even though all of my personal data, Chris did a, a lovely job reading my long list of things um, that I've done. So data would say I should just continue, take my next CMO job, and, and be happy with that. But I had the opportunity to go through several acquisitions during the course of my career. And I felt that, wow, a merger and acquisition is the most data-driven decision that there is. And I saw it ruin so many people's lives, truly. And, and again, here's the other side. Mergers and acquisition, it's a part of our life. Disruption continues to make that scenario the case. But I just felt there's got to be a better way. There's a better way for us to help each other out as human beings when you go through a merger and acquisition. So the book that I'm writing is, is to help those middle managers, right? People who aren't part of the strategic decision making, but who are burdened with the execution how to help them see what's gonna happen, understand what's gonna happen, and how to not just survive it, but thrive through it. Because there is opportunity in chaos. And so the, the presentation that I gave to you today was just my, my first launching pad because it showed me, we've gotta rediscover the humanity in business. We're starting to lose sight of that, and I think the human side of business is so important and so compelling, particularly in an era where we're a little bit fixated on data and AI. So, more than happy, if you have any questions afterward, um, even specific to the book, more than happy to talk with you about that. But I, I trusted my gut, and I'm now on this path. And I'm just very thankful to have had the opportunity to share this with you. Uh, now I want to open up the floor for any questions. Does anyone have questions? We've got about 10 minutes that we can do some Q&A. Can I start? I'm going to start. No, start. I'm sorry. Really, I'm no. Have someone else. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you said um, show your work, and I, I am, I'm really bad at that. So make a gut decision, and you know, I've thought it through and just kind of present it as here's the right answer. Um, I'm horrible at it. Is there a way to show your work without just going back to big data to justify the decision that you've already made? And when I say show your work, so I'm, I'm actually glad you asked that question because. Uh, <clears throat> Your teacher, right? That, that's what it goes back to, is what your math problems wants to make sure what was your thought process to go through it. Nowadays, when I say show your work, it's even just talking through the decision. And actually, it helps you to think about it. Sometimes you actually, it will be your gut, and you aren't even sure where it came from and why. But as you talk it through, and I'm not saying for every single decision, because that would be exhausting. But if there are certain decisions where you realize in the moment, this is just what my gut tells me. And I, you're the leader, so people will be like, okay, well, we're gonna follow what Chris says to do it, and we're gonna run off. But if you pause and take that moment to be able to talk through with the team, here's what the data said, here's what I know to be true based on my experience, and here, here's how I think we need to go about this. And, and I, the tough part of that, that is, I say show your work, show it when you made that decision that went well, and also do it when it didn't. Where did I err? Because again, all of this is to make your brain smarter, to make your gut instinct sharper. So it's not just the successes, but it's equally the times where your decision, and it could have been based on gut, because what happens oftentimes is we find, ah, but that gut instinct was equally influenced by what the data was saying, and the data didn't necessarily cover all of what we should have considered. 
right? So it's, it can get tricky, but this doesn't mean now, Chris, that I expect you to go and show reams of PowerPoints that say, okay, here was what my decision making came like. Because <laughs> that, no one would do it then. But I think if you talk it through, um, that helps people. And it also shows the importance of uh, a gut decision. Cool. I'll bring the mic. Sure. It may be that. Uh, in your uh, process for cultivating decisions with your, uh, with your, with your instincts, uh, the first two steps were to make mental space and to listen to the first answer. The next step was to get out of your head. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that step in the process and how it's different from the first two? Yeah, so the, the best way that I can talk about get out of your head is it's, we talk about functional benefits and emotional benefits. Right? And advertising, you're always trying to find the, the two. The emotional, the functionals is, is really your brain, right? It's the, these are the benefits that I know to be true. The emotional is the things that, that connect with you. You don't even know necessarily why, but they just, it makes you feel a certain way. So that's why I gave the example when uh, I was working in advertising and I'm thankful to have that experience because it was always a combination of functional and emotional, but we knew something really resonated when it touched you emotionally. It just, it made you feel a certain way. So when I say get out of your head, your head makes you look at things rationally. It's the practical linear side of you. By listening to your heart and how it makes you feel, it gives you that, that nugget that just is gonna connect that much more. And I, the, the tough part about this, and I say this so, as someone who, who spent 15 years in advertising, um, and there was one campaign in particular that we didn't do, and to this day, I know it would have just been amazing. Uh, it was with Windex. Um, so I love Essie Johnson, so this is not to out Essie Johnson in any way. And we had done ethnographies, and what had come out of the ethnographies was the fact that people liked clean windows because it let light into their house. Completely different for Windex, though, right? But for ammonia, we should we make windows cleaner? And it was just we we tested and tested, and the testing it did okay, but there's only so much you can get in the storyboard. So this is 15 years, oh, 20 years ago actually. You know, there's only so much you can get from cartoons, but we knew in talking to people that what they liked about clean windows was a lot, a house or an apartment or a home full of light but we didn't take the risk because the data told us, ah, oh, no, they're not, it's not knocking it out of the park and testing. Uh, so I say that because there's always risk, but when you connect with people emotionally, that's the, that's the sweet spot, that's what you wanna hit. And you know it when you feel it. You know it when you feel it, so don't lose sight of that because as we get <coughs> further through creative development and production, I've been on that train, right? It kind of starts to lose some of the emotion, keep the emotion, because that's where you really connect. Uh, we have time for one more. So I'm going to hand go up. Or can you uh, can I just say from back here? Sure. Screen it. So, so once you make the decision, how do you know it's right? What, uh, once you make the decision, how do you know it's right? Yeah. Well, there's a number of, one, typically right. You're going to make the decision, and then you go ahead. You execute, and you see. Now, there are times where Ultimately, you'll have metrics that tell you it's right. I'm assuming you all have different defined metrics that you have to apply that say, here's what success looks like, this is what it is. Beyond just the metrics, though, does it connect? Has the decision that I've made, is it helping us? Is it moving something forward? At the end of the day, I know that's what we're all held to, right? Beyond the metrics. But knowing that something's right beyond just the metrics I think a big part of this too is going just beyond the short term to the long term. Has this, has this decision helped move us forward, not just for now, but for the future? Because so much of our decision making, and I didn't want to go down that path, but so much of our decision making is for the short term. How is it helping us right here in the moment? And, and being right means thinking bigger picture. Is this going to help set us up well for the next several years? Does that answer your question? All right. I want to give a big thank you to Jennifer. Thank you. Uh, let's see. I
I have some operational stuff we need to cover. Um, administrative details, let's see. Please take a notebook and mug as you leave. I think Tiffins have a full set. And the questionnaire. I left oh. extra time. Oh. <laughs>